Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Emphasis Added, a podcast brought to you by the Houston Law Review. I'm one of your Season 6 hosts, Grayson Meckler. And I'm your other Season 6 host, Jeffrey Okola. And today we're joined by a very special guest, our very own Editor-in-Chief, Sophia Winograd. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. Thank you for taking the time out of your day to be here today. Um, in today's episode, we'll begin by discussing Sophia's background and what she did prior to pursuing her legal career here at UHLC. Um, we'll also get some insight into her decision to joining HLR and eventually becoming the editor-in-chief, um, and as well as the role HL- HLR plays in legal scholarship, just broadly speaking. Yeah. Okay, so thank you again for joining us, Sophia. We want to begin by discussing your background. I think, personally for me, one of the best parts of coming to law school, and the University of Houston specifically, is that we have such a diverse group of students. And I think everyone's different backgrounds, like if it's having a job before this or whatever they've done before this, enhances the learning experience a lot. So we want to begin by talking about your background. So tell us a little bit about where you're from, where you did undergrad, things like that. Yeah, awesome. And I agree. I think that UHLC is very special for that reason, and everybody kind of has their story. Mm -hmm. and the stuff that they used to do before law school and everything it just makes everything much more interesting i think um so i was born and raised in mexico city and i lived there up until i was 17. um and that was awesome i enjoy mexico city if y'all haven't gone i really we need to chat (laughs) i know i've actually been wanting to go to mexico city my fiance is like we have to go to mexico city i'm like what's in mexico city yeah it's just so good um there's so many restaurants people are really nice Mm -hmm. it's like a very hustle and bustle sort of place there's multiple museums parks um and the weather is actually pretty lovely Mm -hmm. so it's it's a great place to visit growing up i think it's it's like a hectic place to grow up in traffic can be sometimes super unmanageable and things like that. But anyways, that that that, that is where, I, where I'm from. And then I moved to the U.S. for college. Mm-hmm. Um, so I went to UC Berkeley. I spent four years in California, and that was fantastic. I fell in love with California. The weather is unbeatable and many outdoorsy things to do, mm-hmm. which is such a privilege, really, like when you think about it. Mm-hmm. That sort of stuff is awesome. Um, and then... I moved to Spain. Um, that was where I, you know, when I finished undergrad, I, I had two kind of inclinations. Like one, I really just wanted to explore and travel, um, but I also wanted to work. Mm-hmm. So I kind of found the perfect setup where I was an English teacher um, and I taught third graders in Spain. So it was like check, 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 like traveling and working and then working with kids is super fun. Mm-hmm. Um, they're so smart and curious, and I was not able to speak to them in Spanish, which made, I think, things easy for me just because I could know what they were saying and the things that they were <laughs> planning before <laughs> chaos happened mm-hmm. in, in the classroom. Um, and anyways, that's where I met my husband. He's from Houston, and mm-hmm. that's why we ended up making our way back to the U.S. Um, but after Spain, I we went back to Mexico City. I did some HR work. Um, he always has been working remotely, so it worked out, and then got engaged, and now we're here. Okay, wait, that's so crazy. So he's from Houston. <laughs> yeah. How? What was he doing in Spain? So very similar to me. When he finished, the, and the fun, to make that even crazier, he also went to college in California. Oh, at, um, at Berkeley as well? No, he went to Stanford, okay. um, but he would come to campus often. Oh, my gosh. He did, like, the podcast for the podcast for, <laughs> for sports and stuff. So he, mm-hmm. he went to campus all the time. Um, but he was a little bit tired of the Bay Area. He's mm-hmm. a software engineer, and I think that everybody was speaking about the startup world, everything startup related. Mm-hmm. And so he wanted a break, and... Spain it was. Yeah. Oh my yeah. gosh. Yeah. It's crazy how that works out. I know, mm-hmm. I know. Yeah. It is really crazy. Um, I guess so during your time in Houston, what kind of pushed you towards, you know, pursuing a legal career? Yeah, I think that's an awesome question. Honestly, and there's many moments mm-hmm. recently where I'm like, Wow, that's it's so cool that like law school ended up happening for mm-hmm. me because there were multiple times like in my like mid twenties. I was like, 
what am I going to do? Like, what am I, what, like, what am I doing? Where am I going? Mm-hmm. What is this? And I felt this insane, like, pressure to try to figure it out. And I, I think it also kind of didn't help that my husband's career has been super linear. Mm-hmm. Like, he just kind of knew what he was going to do and started working. And he's been working now for, like, 10 years, which is crazy to think about. But everything was just like that for him. Mm-hmm. With me, when I graduated college, and in college I took like this leadership class where they kind of gave you like your, what, what are you good at or whatever. And I learned that I enjoyed the like problem solving aspect of things, like any job, like I enjoyed that, like trying to figure out and, you know, if there's a question or there's an open-ended question, trying to come up with suggestions or solutions or things to make things better. I think being a teacher is that all the time you just kind of have to figure out what each kid likes and dislikes and the best way to teach people Mm -hmm. and law school came to mind at that point like in college I was like maybe that's a route for me consulting also came to mind but I'm really bad with numbers (laughs) (laughs) so bless our executive (laughs) editor Aaron we go Mm -hmm. through the finances and we sit together and he's the most patient person in the world Mm-hmm. So that's awesome. That just, you know, teamwork. Yeah. Um, hey. But yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, but so consulting was out, out of the picture. Mm-hmm. But law school was there. The only reason I think why I kind of didn't pursue that right off the bat was because it's a huge time commitment. It's three years. Mm-hmm. It's a huge financial commitment. And you kind of also, it helps to know where you want to practice. And I also didn't know. Like, I went to college in California, but really, like, I'm not American. Like, the plan was just to go back to Mexico City. Mm -hmm. And so there were many questions around, like, should I do it, should I not? Mm -hmm. When we got engaged and moved here, my husband was the one who was like, I think now is, like, the actual time for you to take that step because we're stable. we, We love Houston. And, like, maybe you should try to pursue that. And so I'm thankful that he nudged me to do it. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't super clear in my mid-20s, like I said, like, what I I was going to do. So I'm so grateful that I found it. Yeah, no, I love how you talked about comparing yourself to other people. Because before law school, I definitely definitely did that. And I had, like, college friends who, like, knew what they were going to do right away. And I'm like, what? I don't know what I'm going to do. Like, (laughs) like, and how... Like you said, law school is a big commitment. Financially, right. it's a long period of your time to- of your life. What if you don't even like it? Exactly. Mm-hmm. But I think that's a risk you just have to be willing to take. I agree. And even whenever you get into law school, you're still like, wow, comparison really is a thief of joy. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. if you're looking around and like comparing yourself to like, oh, I should be studying more. Like they're studying more. Yeah. You will like never sleep because you're always <laughs> worried about comparing yourself. Yeah. So I think that's a huge thing. Like I've overcome during law school is just like. Do you stay in your own lane, like do your own thing. As long as you feel like you're successful and like what you're doing is right for you, then that's what you should do. I totally agree with that. I think that's so important too. There Mm -hmm. were points where I I felt even like, like a little bit of shame about myself to be like, I, I don't know where I'm going. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know where I want to be. Mm -hmm. There's many questions, but I am thankful for that period, for that, I think like that dark period of my life, Mm -hmm. because I think now it makes you really value being here Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and working towards something and meeting wonderful people and doing the thing, like just like being a student and learning. And so I'm grateful for that. I agree with the comparison thing. I love the staying in your lane. I think if I were to ever kind of chat with somebody who's coming into law school I would Mm -hmm. say like two things like stay in your lane and try to be very kind Mm -hmm. because everyone's dealing with so much stress Mm -hmm. inside outside you never know what's happening with people's lives Mm -hmm. so it just and I found that at U of H I think would y'all agree like it's such a nice community of people like generally everyone seems to be respectful Mm -hmm. and kind of just you know collaborative generally again i don't think people get into like spats or anything like that nothing that i've seen of at least and people are like very very nice very very cordial um if you need something you can generally like ask and nine out of ten times somebody's gonna help you out for sure yes at least that's been my experience here Mm -hmm. yeah Yeah. completely agree i think coming in i didn't know like anyone who had gone to law school or any lawyers Mm -hmm. so in my mind i'm like okay like 
everything's graded on a curve. Everyone's going to be out to get you. Right. No one is out to get you. <laughs> literally, like, no one. literally no one is out to get you. Like, you're out to get yourself. You're out to get to your, yourself, exactly. Like, you're, you're your own worst yourself. enemy. A lot yeah. of times, like, yeah. people are, just, like, the hardest the hardest on themselves. Like, yeah. Oh, yeah. So tough. Like, oh, I should be doing this. I should be in the library eight hours. I should be I should be reading and rereading and rereading. Right. Oh, they're doing this, but... I'm compare again yeah. back to that comparison. I'm comparing myself to what other people are doing, mm-hmm. yeah. which um, again can be very, very taxing because it's stressful already. Yeah, like, it's a lot of work. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And I think you meet people in law school, and like you, like you were saying, Sophia, you have no idea what's going on in their life. Like some yeah. people have just had a kid, some right. people are pregnant. Like mm-hmm. everyone is going through their own thing. I'm yeah. like, you only know what's happening in your life, so I think like. You need to treat everyone with kindness. Yeah. I would say that's a huge thing. I agree. I definitely do. And like we said, this I think the school is super diverse, so you definitely encounter people from all walks of life, all different backgrounds. Mm-hmm. So you only know what you know. Yeah. Yeah. I guess pivoting kind of to law review, with how stressful law school is, <laughs> what kind of motivated you to, you know, join law review, yeah. um, as well as pursue the position as the editor-in-chief? Yeah. Um, so... Law Review, I think, like, was this sort of situation, this thing that I kept hearing about, but was very abstract, especially the first semester. And Mm -hmm. I think that that is similar to, like, it's a similar experience to a lot of people. Um, And, and like you, Grayson, I also, you know, didn't have, didn't have anybody who knew about law school in the U.S. or anything like that. So just, like, it was, I kept hearing about it, but I didn't really quite know what it was. Mm-hmm. And I think that ultimately the people who really helped bring that to like reality mm-hmm. as opposed to just a super like superficial idea mm-hmm. were my TAs. I think TAs play a huge role to getting acquainted with law school, learning, making friends. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I had wonderful TAs for the first semester of law school. So it was like, Torts, contracts, CIFPRO, mm-hmm. um, and all of them were phenomenal. And I want to say all of them were in the law review. Um, I'm like thinking of each one of them, and I think yes, mm-hmm. um, or most of them. And if not, they were in other journals. So like they were all very involved with the school. Mm-hmm. And I looked up to those students a lot. I think they were clearly very successful, and they were spending so much time out of their day trying to explain things to me and guiding me. So I created that really special bond and I was like, oh, like they're in the law review. Like, I guess that's something like I should work towards. Like that's a, like, that's a really cool place to be or whatever. Then I started learning more about what they do, mm-hmm. um, what the organization does, what a legal journal is. And I thought it was, it was fascinating. I enjoyed the fact that it's a team effort. Mm-hmm. There's so many of us working towards an end product and um i got very inspired and then yeah i guess that's that's for joining the law review i just wanted wanted to do it mm-hmm. um for the eic role that 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 took a little bit longer <laughs> to think about <laughs> that so i loved it from the beginning like i loved the law review from the beginning um all of my i think ta friends kept saying to me it's going to be a lot of work And I think the board above us was extremely transparent with that from the Mm get-go. So I think I knew that coming in. Obviously, the question mark was whether I was going to enjoy it. I ended up liking it, the detail orientation of site checking, getting to read um, these articles and specifying in a portion of them. And again, like the team effort, like I liked... I enjoyed the fact that my work was going to be edited by, by someone else and then someone else and then someone else. Um, so then the, the talk about elections, I think, comes up later in the fall semester. Mm-hmm. Um, I had a few people kind of asking, like, board, like from the board above, just mm-hmm. wondering what I would do, what I wouldn't. Um, one of them suggested the role. Mm-hmm. Um, and I remember that when she talked about it. I think I was just like, oh, I don't know, I don't know, it's a lot of work, it's a lot. And she texted me a couple hours later and said, I do not want to pressure you, like, that's the least, of, like, that's not what I'm trying to do. Mm-hmm. I think you love this place so much um, that I think you could do it. And so just kind of think about it. Um, 
And I was like, yeah, no, that's totally fine. And I, I'm happy that you, like, brought it up. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then just kind of mulling through it, mulling through it, winter break, came, winter break came about, and I think this is the thing. The decision had to be done with my husband. Mm-hmm. Like, I think just even putting it as, at, like, you know, for I guess for people who are not in the law review or whatever, mm-hmm. you kind of have to say which ones you're interested in and kind of rank those positions yeah. by your level of interest. I did know that if you're putting things at the top, then that does mean that you're taking it very seriously. Mm-hmm. So before I even was considering where to put the role, um, I had to have a conversation with Alec, my husband, because it had already been a really rough first year, as I'm sure for all of us. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. You see personal connections sometimes dissipate, sometimes weaken, some, like it's kind of the name of the game sometimes. And just in my mind thinking, this was going to be extended a little bit more with Mm -hmm. a lot of more work i had to talk to him and see like if we were good to take this on like Mm -hmm. if we could Mm -hmm. as a couple as a marriage as a family Mm -hmm. um he was very supportive of it i always kid around that in my mind um our mass head and all of our members Mm -hmm. also include our loved ones And it's not only, like, a mass hit of 70-plus people, but it's a mass hit of hundreds because Mm -hmm. it's not just us. In order for us to show up, there's a lot in the back end. And he's he's my rock. So, Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, that's that's how it... Once I had kind of his blessing, I said, okay, I'm just going to... I'm going to say I'm interested and we'll Mm -hmm. see what happens. Yeah, no, I think that's really interesting. And I think you not to, like... Or to pat you on the back... You are, like, such a good editor-in-chief. And Thank you. I love how you, like, actually took the time to get to know each and every one of us. Thank you. Because I didn't join Law Review because, like, of the work. Because I didn't even know what the, like, what we did on the Law Review. <laughs> I joined it because I was like, I want to make friends. And right. everyone that I knew on the Law Review that was older, I'm like, they're all genuinely nice people. Mm-hmm. So I'm assuming that's just, like, the community that this journal attracts. Exactly. So, like, I really appreciate the way you, like, go out and get to know every one of us. And, I like, appreciate that. The things you put together and everything. You know. you're, you're awesome. Like, honestly. Like, it's such a pleasure. And mm-hmm. that's a huge part of, of, I think, the job is that you get to know everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that's exciting to me because each one of y'all is special. And mm-hmm. every single one of y'all have stories and backgrounds mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. ideas. Mm-hmm. And that's exciting. So... Yeah. But but again, props to again all the people in the leadership. Y'all have fostered that environment and kept that environment going. Um, so yeah, nah, shout out to you. A hundred percent. Yeah, all a great team. <laughs> I know. Okay, so now that you've you've been in the role for a few months, how do you feel like being editor in chief? Does it compare to what you thought it would be? Is it more work than you thought it would be? How is like the balance going? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, and I actually talk about this a lot um, with the outgoing EIC. Um, and with Alec, I think it was, it, it's more difficult than I thought it was going to be. Um, but the interesting piece is that the challenge is really, of course, it's a lot of work. Um, but that was already something we knew. I think the challenge has been with learning to be flexible and adapt to new things and kind of not being too hard on oneself Mm -hmm. is a huge one um, where, you know, obviously uh, multiple things you can do better. There's things where maybe you could communicate better or more clearly or, you know, more in a more organized way or this and that. So it's just kind of learning to be kind to oneself Mm -hmm. while you're learning the ropes as well and establishing yourself and and that sort of thing, I think Mm -hmm. is a big one. Um, And I think... The rest is simply um, knowing that knowing that the role itself sometimes has difficult aspects where when people have feedback or people have worries or concerns or whatever, you will be the, the very first one to get them. Mm-hmm. So that is, I think, it, as I'm a person who is a warrior. So it's just like I worry all the time. Mm-hmm. And so... I have had to learn to take those things and not worry like so much Mm -hmm. and take action instead and like do things and hear and hear perspectives and feedback, but without internally worrying. Mm -hmm. And so, but, but it's, that's like so powerful too, because Mm -hmm. 
our jobs will be that. Like we will have clients mm-hmm. and we will have to be sometimes the point person for a client. And the client might trust us and the client, you know, might be asking questions to us. Mm-hmm. Uh, some of them to which we might not have an answer right away. Or sometimes like a client may not be as happy with X, Y, C things or whatever. And I think we will be the ones who kind of have to navigate that. So mm-hmm. it's it's been powerful to learn how to manage my own emotions as as the months and, and the role goes by. I think other than that, it's it's been a lot more fun also than I thought. Because it's just, I mean, it sounds silly, but it really warms my heart to see the office mm-hmm. fall. To have people come and chat and bring their lunch and sit here and chit chat and just talk all the time. Like I think generally the office is, there's noise, there's things happening, there's people coming in and out, mm-hmm. they're grabbing a snack, they're sitting down. Mm-hmm. That that part is really fun. And I think it's so important to lay the foundation of like we're a team at the end of the day. We're mm-hmm. all here and we all want to want this to be great. Yeah. Yeah. I completely agree with you saying like law review is similar to a job. I think that's one of the best reasons to join law review because like even if you don't, even if you feel like site checking and stuff, you're like, oh, this is pointless. Like this isn't right, for me. Right. It teaches you attention to detail. It teaches you how to meet a deadline. Exactly. It teaches you how to communicate with people on a team. Like that is all stuff totally. that's going to translate to what you do in your career. A hundred percent. And like to exactly like I think the power of communication is so important. Like, knowing, you know, if you're struggling with a certain, like, paragraph or whatever and you can't really, like, substantiate it and you feel like you're really struggling, like, reaching out for help is a huge thing and maybe, like, not trying to take it in on t- for yourself. And, like, those sorts of things, I think, are so valuable. So mm-hmm. I'm, like, a, I'm a huge, yeah, pro of that. Mm-hmm. Like, in a group of, of, of members of Law Review, that's, like, a wealth of knowledge. People who you might not be the best at Blue Book, but you know people who know the Blue Book from, like, front to back. So relying on them can really help that, those situations. I also really like agree with the fact that you were talking about how rather than like internalizing it, beating yourself up and worrying about things, you become a little more action oriented. Yeah. It's like, okay, there's a problem here. If I worry about it, the problem is still going to be here. But if I create like a plan of action to like tackle it, like not only am I kind of solving this, not only am I taking stress off of myself, but like we're leaving the situation net better. And I thought that's, like, very, very powerful and, like, a good lesson to, like, learn from, you know, being part of Law Review. I totally agree. And I think I loved also something that you just said that, um, I'm like, I may not be, a, like, an expert in X, Y, C things, but maybe the, the next person mm-hmm. will be. I think that's so special of this community of people because for I, I, I place the example about numbers. Mm-hmm. Like... I'm not a numbers person. I've never been. Mm -hmm. But I've had to kind of learn to be and, like, learn to understand and our finances and have that on track and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But I can rely on somebody who has a background in all of this and is exemplary at what he does. And we can sit and he will very patiently go through it with me and I don't feel judgment or anything like that. Mm -hmm. It's literally just kind of like we're supporting each other Mm -hmm. and everybody has places where they're a little bit weaker and a little bit stronger. Mm-hmm. So that's, I love that too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I guess we'll pivoting to um, HLR, what we do, and our role as it pertains to like legal scholarship. Um, I was going to ask, um, how exactly does like Law Review, Houston Law Review, contribute to like the broader legal scholarship? Um, if you could speak on that. Yeah, I think that So something to, I guess the context to this answer Mm -hmm. is that law reviews are, I think, a very specific thing that happens in the U.S. for the most part. Mm -hmm. And my my brother, my my older brother, my only brother, Mm -hmm. um, he's a lawyer in Mexico. So he did his entire like legal career in Mexico. Mm -hmm. And the other day, not the other day, but a few months back. Mm -hmm. He was telling me, like, hey, like, that's awesome that you'll have that, like, wealth of knowledge and that a lot of law schools have that wealth of knowledge via the law reviews where professors and experts get to write about 
everything related to the law mm -hmm. and where they spend their careers on topics that can then help the judiciary, they can help practitioners, they can help students. We just got cited by the Supreme Court and it's not the first time that that has happened. Hey. Yeah, that's, like fantastic, that's so awesome. Right? Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself that it's so true and it's such a privilege to have that as members of the legal field mm -hmm. to have something where you can look back on and say, I bet an expert here, I bet a professor here talked about this and wrote something about this in some somewhere, in a law review somewhere in the country. And you'll find it, mm -hmm. right? Like you'll likely find something adjacent or maybe right on point with that mm -hmm. that will guide how you understand these topics. And when you're a student, it's fantastic because those can be like really helpful tools to write your own note, to write your own case, to write a case note, to write your own piece. Mm -hmm. As a practitioner, it can also be really, really good to just think about arguments and kind of educate your research and ways that you're thinking about it. Even if you lean transactional or litigation, it just, there might be questions that you may have and law reviews are a great source of understanding them better. And in the judiciary, I mean, it's amazing to, to know that judges and justices look at what we publish and consider it for supportive evidence for arguments that they want to bring up. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's amazing. I think it's key. I, I think I could not imagine anything without it. Mm -hmm. um, and even hearing the side of you know, lawyers who don't have that, and my brother was like, you have no idea how much I would love to have those sources mm -hmm. like out there for me to just explore in case I have a question or I'm curious about whatever. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's neat. With us specifically, it's fantastic that every volume has an assortment of different like topics related to the law. Like, it can be tax, it can be property, it can be copyright, it can be like whatever. Mm -hmm. And we publish it in hopes that it helps people, it educates people. Um, so it's so, it's so valuable. Yeah. First, that's so cool that we got cited by the Supreme Court. Right. And I'm like, wow, it really makes all the, like the footnote packets and stuff. I'm like, yeah. it's worth it. It's yeah. all worth it. <laughs> exactly. That's so cool. Exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, can you talk a little bit more about how you like pick topics for volumes and stuff? And yeah. like, how do you go about selecting articles? Yeah, that's awesome. That's a really great question. So that's actually one of like the things that um, I did, like one of the first, I guess, tasks that I did transitioning to the role. Mm -hmm. So we, we start our process of selecting articles in February. So every February, um, the younger board mm -hmm. gets to decide via a committee. There's a committee of students who review hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of submissions by professors from all over the country and on topics related to everything about the law. Mm -hmm. And what we do as students is we read all of those and we grade them based on content or like length or we look for those sorts of things internally like do they like meet the length of a normal law review article uh the amount of footnotes are we able to take on something like that we for example saw pieces that would be really 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 big um that you know there, there's there's staff constraints and there there's constraints that go with that and so that that educates kind of what we're looking for mm -hmm. um, and we look at what professors have written about in the past things like that so we have like this this spreadsheet where we organize who has read what we talk about that which is really exciting too because typically more than one student is reading a piece. Mm -hmm. And so you talk about it, you talk about the qualities of the piece, what we thought was great, um, things that we are excited about, and then you ultimately make an offer or not, and then you hope that they accept. And if they don't, you keep going, and the process can take months. For us, we wrapped it up in April, um, right in time for the board of directors meeting, so that was really exciting because we got to s tell our our board and our alumni board that we had our volume, the content of the volume set. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then where they will publish, like if it will be an issue one or three or five, it it's a little bit kind of up to them sometimes. Like we, we let the authors also pick. Some of them have preferences based on like 
or the calendar year and when they want to publish and some of them don't mm-hmm. and so we kind of organize it that way yeah okay yeah. wow yeah there's so many moving parts that yeah. like we don't notice because like we don't work on that part of it but yeah yeah it's really it's interesting a, it's a it like takes a village you know it's a, right? yeah sounds like truly. a very involved process with a bunch of moving pieces and yeah y'all found a way to you know get it done in three months mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah we, uh, <laughs> we persevered mm-hmm. um but yeah I, I you know i remember those three months are, are hectic because mm-hmm. um there's lots of things to review and you're waiting to hear back and deadlines and stuff like that with the offer just like any offer so things like that uh, there's a lot of moving pieces but we're so excited for Volume 62. We're so excited for our authors, and it's going to be great. Yeah. I have no doubt in mind it's going to be great. Um, but speaking as it pertains like legal scholarship, you've also been, or will be, uh, published. Um, could you speak a little bit as it pertains to that? Yeah. That's so exciting. Um, so, so again, for, for listeners who, who may not be in the law review or who may want to join or we're thinking about law school. Mm-hmm. Um, so for the law review, when you join as a member in your year two, so your fall 12, when mm-hmm. you join, um, one of the expectations of your membership is that you write either a comment or a note uh, related to a legal topic. And I think we're, we're very, we're super generous in terms of the topic. Like mm-hmm. really, I think you can honestly pick something that you're passionate about Mm -hmm. and then go with it. Um, I was excited about my topic. So I chatted about, I I wrote about Senate Bill 17. Mm -hmm. So that's, this is a Texas bill that got approved January of 2024. Mm -hmm. And while I was writing it, um, kind of my task was to understand what it said Mm -hmm. and find something to focus on in that bill. Because there was a lot of, essentially it's the DE&I, the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Bill, Mm -hmm. that ultimately took away the DE&I offices in Texas, in in Texas higher education Mm -hmm. institutions. Yeah. So I, there was a lot of media opera about this. So the step one was to understand like what it says. So just like read it, understand it, and find something to say about it. Mm -hmm. And in that, I found a little section that talked about recruiting for professors. Mm -hmm. And essentially the bill says that you can't compel a professor, like a candidate to become a professor, you can't compel this person to write a diversity statement, which I'm sure some of us like, like we, you know, sometimes for college admission purposes, law school admission purposes, or Mm -hmm. sometimes even jobs, you are given the the opportunity to write like a diversity statement to talk about your background, where you're coming from, all the all these mm-hmm. things. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, so universities cannot compel that. Um, and then you know, there's questions about whether the candidate then gives it anyway, whether the university can take it into account or not. Mm-hmm. So I delve into that and just try to understand it within the framework of affirmative action and then I just try to understand it on the framework of just practically like what that means Mm -hmm. for us as universities and for us as students Mm -hmm. and for university administrations like how can you really how can you assess a candidate um, without certain information Mm -hmm. that maybe a diversity statement would give you Mm -hmm. and um, yeah that's what it's basically about yeah yeah (laughs) Yeah. no congrats so much on that that's such a big thing to be published it was really Mm -hmm. and that sounds like a really interesting topic i hope i hope i hope that it it ends up you know being being okay i it'll be in the last issue Mm -hmm. um and so technically the last issue Mm -hmm. board 63 which is the young the young board the the people Mm -hmm. who just uh became Mm -hmm. members will be like fully on like in their new roles overseeing that. And I'm I'm honestly like like so excited because mm-hmm. they'll edit it, they'll they'll do what they the, what they need to do to the piece and and it'll be I'm excited for that. I'm excited. Yeah, uh, that's that's like your last little gift to yeah. HLR. Like, <laughs> like, here you go. <laughs> edit my paper. <laughs> Hope you all don't hate it. Enjoy. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. But yeah, no, I have no doubt that it will turn out fine. 
Also, do you plan to, like, edit or not edit, but publish more, like, legal scholarship in the future, you know, provide a little bit more to... Maybe, um, yes. Um, I, there's something about, I think, academia that is really mm-hmm. exciting just in general. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's one of those things where, like, pursuing an academic path at some point is, like, super exciting. I truly, like... I don't think I'm I'm smart enough to like go up there and teach like a, a topic, but I think it you can do it with experience because with experience you learn more about what you're interested in. You mm-hmm. le- you learn more about what you want to do. Mm-hmm. So um, I'm I'm curious about y'all's topics for the for the note on the comment. Do y'all remember? <laughs> yeah, mine was I love Professor Hester. I oh, had yeah. him for stat reg and for environmental law, and I just, like, love his personality. I think he's great. So I was like, I'm going to do something environmental. So I talked about, like, climate change litigation and how mm-hmm. some courts allow it and some courts don't. I thought it was really interesting. Yeah, but, that's awesome. Yeah. I've heard great things about him. Um, I wrote about the um, American with Disabilities Act, um, specifically, like, about their reasonable accommodation um, requirement. And... Because there's, like, a circuit split on it about, like, how far should it really extend, should reasonable accommodation extend to things like helping workers commute to and from, like, the mm-hmm. job site. Some courts are like, no, like, we're only focused on the job sites. Some places are like, yeah, you know, it's a scheduling issue. It's like, a, so it should be covered under reasonable accommodations. Um yeah, so that's what I wrote mine on. I found it very, very, like, interesting. Jeffrey, didn't you get an award for your yeah. paper? Yeah. Can we also talk about that? Don't bury the lead. I, 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 yeah. I, I don't know about Honorable that. Honorable mention. Yeah, I, I don't know about all day. You know, yeah. I, I, no, I did my best. Awesome. I did my best. That is awesome. Yeah. I'm sure it was great. Yeah, yeah. yeah that yeah. is fantastic. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. That's, and, and it sounds, yeah, it sounds really interesting and also something wor- worth chatting about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, super interesting. It's just like, and y'all probably went, y'all, y'all definitely went through it as well. Like just the months of like putting together that yeah. paper, the amount of time like you spend with this piece of work and the amount of like sources you read, like it is a daunting task and I'm just glad that, you know, I was able to put something out there that was worthwhile. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, I'll say like, even if you don't want to get published, learning so much about a topic makes you feel so smart mm-hmm. yeah and it's kind of like it's honestly fun you get to chat with like your mentor about your topic and if you enjoy writing i think it's like a good experience mm-hmm. all in all yeah mm-hmm. i totally agree it was a it was a good experience definitely a lot of work like, mm-hmm. like you yes. said um but it, it ended up being very enjoyable yeah, yeah. Exactly. it's worth it yeah exactly. yeah i agree okay so looking toward the future of hlr do you have any plans or what mark do you want to leave on law review as the editor in chief? Yeah, I think that's a huge question. Um, so I, I think I think about it in two ways. So you've got like the output and the input. The output is what we create, um, what we put out there, this volume itself. I think my goal for that is to maintain the standards of quality that we have had for 60 plus years mm-hmm. and have that have the Houston Law Review continue to be a source that people trust, a source that people go back to, and that's a source that's excellent. Mm-hmm. So I think that's that's the output. But I think in order to create the output, there's a lot of input that goes with it, which is us as a community and us as a team. I think some really, really strong foundations have been set for us for from boards before us who, you know, battled COVID and like, you know, they have been really thrown into very difficult challenges and situations. Mm-hmm. I feel so much gratitude for what occurred before us. I think context is key. Like we just didn't just pop over here like there, there were people who transitioned us. There were people who took a chance on us. And so I'm grateful for them and the fantastic foundation that they've laid of positivity and community. Mm-hmm. I want to keep that going. Um, I think it's important to continue to nurture our alumni network. And I think there's people who, who look back on the Houston Law Review as a really fond time in their life and in their legal career. And I, I want to keep bringing those people back and keep connecting. Um, I also want this place to be, 
a community where anybody who has any question about anything, like if they want to do a clerkship, if they want to work on something transactional, if they want to do litigation but aren't sure about a clerkship, if they want to go in-house, like whatever, that there's somebody who either they know or from word of mouth who did that. Mm -hmm. I And I think that, that that's been the case for me, where it's easy to pinpoint who has done what and then people have generally been fantastic at giving me the time to talk to me. Mm -hmm. And I kind of want to carry that on. Like I, I want to have members feel like they've not only gained technical skills of editing and detail orientation, but that this community expands broader than that. Like it's a community that can really help you get where you want to be or at least guide you on how to get, get go from point, point A to point B. Um, and so I think the way to do that is just more events, more fun opportunities, more chances to meet and get to know one another, um, and just more, like I guess, like practical things like being able to have everybody's phone number and the board through one click and being able to say, okay, like I heard that this person is doing something really cool this summer. I'm just going to text them. Mm -hmm. That sort of thing, I think, really goes a long way. Um, so, yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited about that. I think everyone's really cool. Also, very sporty from what I saw at the pickleball tournament. <laughs> yeah, everyone is quite athletic. <laughs> everyone is quite athletic. So there's definitely lots to learn from everyone. Mm -hmm. And I, I I, think keeping that going and that good energy going and see, having this place be a welcoming space for everyone mm -hmm. is key. Yeah. Completely agree. I think it's almost like a job. Like, if you yeah. nurture, like, not that we're employees, but, like, <laughs> if you treat people well, like, they're going to want to do good work and they're going to want to be here and they're going to want to hang out and have lunch here. Yeah. So I think it's so important to, like, keep that community going. Because that's why people love the Law Review. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's fun. And then there's, like, like jokes and people are laughing. And it's just, it is, like, what we do, I think, is very serious. Mm -hmm. And it has, like, a huge impact like like I said, in the legal field, and it's fantastic. But also, like, we're students. Mm -hmm. And, like, we're also, like, stre like it's okay to have fun. Mm -hmm. It's okay to laugh. It's okay to be here and, like, eat a bagel. And, mm -hmm. like, just, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, so that, that part, I think, is, it warms my heart. And mm -hmm. I want to keep that as a feeling that, you know, people have when they graduate and they think back to this time. Well, yeah, no, that, that's an amazing vision again this being kind of like a moment of reprieve as we move forward and we just think back on like the fond memories in the law review. Also, like I really appreciate the part about like creating a bigger network, like me being like a first gen law student, there's a lot of stuff I didn't know at all. Yeah. And having access to people who've done the things that people might want to do, whether mm -hmm. it's litigation, in-house, so on and so forth. And you can easily call them email them set up like a coffee yeah talk it out like that is indispensable in my opinion yeah and you know you reminded me we'll be having a clerkship panel mm -hmm. in like i think september 17th or something mm -hmm. and i like clerkships is another thing and we could have a, a there's a there's a fantastic podcast actually <laughs> on course. this yes there, there is there's a fantastic yes. podcast on this but it just goes to show the entire process is super obscure sometimes and very difficult to, to manage. Mm -hmm. And three alumni are coming in to speak about their experience of how they applied, who they applied to, how they handle that. And we'll have our members here, whoever wants to come, and they'll be here. It's going to be a very chill, very relaxed sort of setup. Mm -hmm. um, there will be some food, and we, you know, we'll just ask them their experience, and hopefully... That sort of stuff helps. We could do the same with in-house opportunities. We could do the same with transactional. We could so have law review be also like a tool for people mm -hmm. to learn more about what they want to do, how they want to do it. Yeah, completely agree. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you so much for joining us on the first episode of season six. Thank you so you much. You were a great first guest, Sophia. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. It's an honor to have y'all here. I think the world of both of you. Amazing job. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for listening and or watching Emphasis Adding, a podcast brought to you by Houston Law Review. If you enjoyed what you heard, please follow us on Spotify, YouTube, or whichever platform you listen to your podcast. You can also follow us on Instagram at Emphasis Added Pod to keep up when new episodes are dropping. Additionally, if you'd like to 
subscribe to Houston Law Review and receive either mailing or an electronic subscription, please find the link below. Thank you.